do it as an industry, we all benefit. Is that really so basically, it was more about its timing. Um, so that project started before contracts for differences came in. It was back when the rocks were there. And so there was no incentive for competition. So all the developers got together and said, uh, this is an area where if we work together, um, we can make a difference. And the thing about engineering design, a bit like different to gearboxes where you buy from, is um, you have your consultant designers who design things. You then have your insurers who have to check mm -hmm. So it needs to be certified. You then have the bank yeah. who has to check it as well. Um, you yourself might also. So you've got all these people involved in the design process, all of whom are working for others as well. Of course, yeah. they've got the yeah, uh, sure. Chinese wall, but, you know, it, it, it's sort of, it is kind of a single industry problem. There's similar lead, leading age and tip erosion, you know, there's a third party company that offers an add-on solution to that and they warrant it and yeah. they to develop it. And similarly, how do you get people to jointly collaborate yeah. to share and solve the problem? It's pretty difficult. But since that since that project finished, um, CFDs came in. And so then all of the companies, the developers, um, definitely won't share. So my project with Ersted is with Ersted. And Although we have very favourable contractual terms for what about analysts? We could just get a banner shot. It's bright in there. It is bright in there. This was. This was just tiny. Yeah, uh, I did have to go run. Yes. This is so quick. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, there are you know, five or thirty incomes. Still saying. Oh, um, yeah, it's like the. Yeah. But I don't know if that's too boring. Do you think it? Oh, Murray. You can get weird. Yeah, Murray. Yeah. Kind of fact, yeah. yeah. Where it's like Which you wouldn't necessarily know until we get back to the office. Yeah. Like but seriously, me, it's, it's, it's nice the way it sort of goes off. It's like kind of. Should we just have a look? Birds, travels, and you know, land mag, obviously. I mean, the bird, the bird thing. Um, cats kill more birds in the UK. Probably a factor of thousands. So I guess we'd have them on this side looking this way. So cats are the biggest yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, oh, you, can, you can look up this. Yeah. Not necessarily. I can so, see now. Like, it, it just because it would fade I'm it more into the. Oh, I'm I'm yeah. yeah. And then I can try it over here. That may be all right. But you're not going to be living next to I guess so. I guess so. And we will. We do. There are people in this room, of course, that we we'll need to wait. Okay, we'll do it. Two hundred meters away, away from the central area. They definitely, they'll definitely make a noise. Yeah, they'll definitely, they'll definitely make noise. You know, yeah, yeah. So that could get annoying. I don't think it's definitely interesting. No, 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 not not at all. Yeah, because it's not going to be like the central area. It's going to be like the central area. Okay, so in the European interiors, so how how far should that be? Like a more than I don't I don't know, but if you if you were to drive around in the UK, you will see you yeah. questions to a lot of five on they're on farmland, yeah. pretty much. A, a fair way away from where people are living. Or they're next to you can often see them when you're driving on the motorways. You'll see them in the yeah. this way. Yeah. Um, where are the houses? On the way to Okay, so I've got a mad idea. Yeah. Oh, that's right. A bit. Which we might have one of our two houses. Yeah. Um, if you want to do the same thing. I quite like that way. Looking there, yeah. Yeah. So you put a skin on them, like you do with their plates. They look very nice. They can look even more beautiful. I think they look very nice. They're very graceful. Yeah. I agree with that. But they, yeah. and they're saving the planet. I mean, what yeah. more could you want? 
It's just not um, a problem that the Tory government has. I, I think, um, as the, yeah, as the out. younger generation come up, the perception of winning in Australia. Have you seen the, you must have seen the pictures of Texas. Yes, so it's slightly worried that my colleagues would have I have to see the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I look good. It's Texas gentlemen, not me. Have you been to Houston? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, there must be studies done. Yeah, yeah my right, thing, but, um, Malcolm, is um, yeah. I was thinking like we need someone to just kind of talk about like where we are and what how the day has been as well. So if you can just do a little bit in. Approximately there, we may need to study. Eleanor, you will be on this side. On this side, side? yeah. You're addressing Eleanor, not the camera, at least. <laughs> I'll just look it straight into the lens. Did you lose the glass? Oh, yes, yeah, just <laughs> and, the, and the name tag. Well, name tag not so bad, I've seen. Oh, if, if just the, the glasses. Well. So if I stop going, please remind me, Carson, you and Eric. Who's Eric? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing this? No, of course, go. Sorry, I'm Malcolm. I'm um, Eric. Nice to meet you, Malcolm. Okay. Sophia. Sophia, hi. Sophia, Sophia. 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 Otherwise, yeah. I, I go into panic mode, and then, yeah, I, yeah. and then what's worse is my wife says I go into video mode, <laughs> okay. which means I talk funny. Yeah. We can redo things if you're not happy. What is, can you just start by saying, like, uh, explaining, <laughs> <laughs> explaining where you, like, you know, oh, where we are, where are just and, not getting it, and maybe it's share, share focus, some of the yeah, highlights of the day for you, uh, or, or just say something nice about oh, the yeah, day. Just, yeah, I wonder um, there is stuff that are um, some lovely quotes. So, it's been really nice things. Yeah, what is it? Batchet came up. Batchet, batchet crazy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, we have to be more batchet crazy to actually address the talent. <laughs> and, and that was what. Um, I like that. It. I think Anne will cut me from the video. <laughs> um, so, so must I swear every second word and then yeah, that cuts yeah. me out completely. Yeah. Um, oh. I think. Um, yes, and then so then the next question we uh, which you should be very familiar with this. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges we are facing for the net zero transition? And then we're going to jump zero to zero. Pardon? Zero transition. Zero. Zero. But today is net zero in the UK, which I know is contentious. But what okay, so what do you want to? Uh, so do you want to stop? Uh, hold on, it's, it's, so um, we're just going to start by like introducing the day. And then talk about some of our biggest challenges, and then we're going to skip to the Zero Institute, and then you're going to talk about how the Zero Institute is going to address some of these challenges. So let's just go. Um, And the very first thing is just state your name and affiliation for the recording. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. Uh, I'm Malcolm McCulloch and I head up the Energy Power and Power Group in the Department of Engineering Science. And today, this beautiful sunny day, we're in Oxford and we're at the Energy Day uh, where we've got a group of about 100 people all coming together to discuss the challenges of around how do we get to net zero in the UK. With a specific emphasis around the energy system. So some of the great insights that we've had so far is that there's lots of good ideas, lots of good technologies, and lots of good ways of thinking about people and systems. But the biggest challenge is there's a lack of urgency and that we are feeling that we need to do stuff, but it's not, we don't feel like our feet are to the coals, excuse the bad pun. Um, but that we really need to up our game in terms of actually translating these wonderful ideas into real world differences. Maybe I'll just get you to say the beginning part again, and then instead of say a hundred people, because I think it's more than that, and I think we want to make it feel more than that. Okay, so, so maybe say a couple of hundred. Oh, wait, is that true? No, so well over a hundred people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just the first segment again. So was that my name as well? No, you can forget about that. Say it. We're here oh. at Oxford Energy Day. Okay. Uh, we're here in Oxford, it's a sunny day, and we've got well over 100 people 
coming together on the Oxford Energy Day to discuss how do we get UK to a net zero position. Yeah. Is that okay? That's mm. yeah, sure. Um, You're not to edit the slice Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. Maybe put the two together. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're um, how, so you sort of outlined some of the challenges before in the first thing. So can you um, speak about how the Zero Institute um, and perhaps say the new Zero Institute, um, okay. how that is going to address? So do you want to say something like we're about to launch the new, or have you got Nick saying that or something? No, no, you can say about, you can reference the launch, yeah. Okay. Um. Um, sorry, I just, just need to think, uh, get my ducks in a row. I'm moving, we're just going to mess with screenshot up. Sorry, you said roughly that. Yeah, <laughs> I know because you saw this here jump. <laughs> okay, um, today we're really pleased to announce the uh, a launch of the new Zero Institute. Um, Zero is an, ac is an acronym, uh, the Zero Carbon Energy Research at Oxford, which is the silent C, and we are trying to. Um, we are delivering a new research program looking at how do we transition the world to a zero energy, a zero carbon. Uh, the aim of the Institute is to develop significant activity to help accelerate the world move to a zero carbon energy system. And we mean zero uh, and particularly zero fossil fuels. We know we're going to have to have a very difficult challenge because it intersects with multiple sectors. And specifically, the ones that we're addressing in this institute are along three themes. One is around uh, heating and cooling. The second one is around zero carbon energy use. And the third one is around zero carbon long-term energy storage. Alongside that, we're also putting together a wider program to enable industry and external parties uh, such as governments uh, globally to interact a lot a lot easier and a lot better with the over 200 academics working in energy within Oxford. Uh, so this is going to be a really great day to announce such a fantastic activity where we're taking the next step to making a significant difference to helping the world move to a place which is going to be fairer and more just and a better place for everybody where we can Yeah, Fred here. How are you doing? Hi, I'm fine, thanks. Very good. Um, have you got slides we can do a quick check? Um, yes, to share. I them off. Can, I st can I share them from my end? Because it I would be preferable. I'd rather show yeah, them from my end. definitely. Yeah. That'd be great. Perfect. I'll just show my screen then. Can you see those? I certainly can. Let's just try dancing through them. For some reason, my oh, here we go. Yeah, can you see them changing? Yeah, it looks great. Great, okay, excellent. Uh, that's brilliant. Okay, cool. So, you're, I believe, up first. Um, oh, so, I oh, yes, I am. I think yes. so. I uh, guess so. You'll be introduced, and then we'll hand over to you. So, I'll get you on the screen. I'll just switch across onto this. Hold on a second. Okay, so what we'll see is that. Um, on the screens at the front, we should see your presentation and you as well, but I've just blanked the screen, so you can't see that, so hold on. Yeah, so brilliant. At the moment, you're seeing me, but it will be you uh, on the okay. left screen, right screen, and uh, and then your presentation on the right, so okay. that's all good. Brilliant. Okay. Um, my, my volume's okay, if you can hear me. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Sounds really good. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got... Um, Five minutes, I think, of me. So I should just, um, I'll be I'll be on this call in a second, but I'll just, I've just got to screw and check out the other reads now. So uh, we're good to go in a second. Great. Thank you.
you and I. Hi, Alistair. Hi. Can you hear me? It's on yes. here. Can you see me? Hi, Anne. Can you see me? Uh, no, I can't see you. I can't hear you. But anyhow, we're starting to come into the room now, just for your own benefit. Oh, I see it. I can you stand you. here to be able to see. Yeah, we can all stand here. What's that, Alison? I can see two rooms. Um, you can see me, right? Yeah. 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 so sweet. I My left lady came on because they replaced the doors while I was stuck there. Actually, I opened the door. She let me go back to you. I'm like, she must tell. And she was like, like so high ways. I was literally surprised. But it was so fun though. I really enjoyed it. We have like honestly, you have to know that like, it's such an amazing place. Yes, and every Sarah, it's a bit a bit north and on the coast, basically, directly, it's very beautiful. And we can just read it. If you go, let me know what I'm doing. <laughs> I have no plans. Sorry, just just showing myself here. Sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. Let me know if you do it. So Alison's ready. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And then Sammy will be uh, here at the station which we're doing. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone. And sorry, the person who who is supposed to be chairing this hasn't turned up. <laughs> so I'm going to step in, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Alison, who's online by the looks of it. Hi. Hi. Uh, and she's going to talk about bioenergy. So over to you. Great, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, bioenergy, focusing on land use trade-offs. So I'm, I'm actually going to stray into other energy-related realms as well, such so as solar energy, and really asking, you know, what can we do in Oxfordshire um, with the kind of limited land resources we've got available and the competing needs for energy, housing, food, uh, biodiversity recovery and carbon sequestration. So I'm going to focus on the work we did last year for the PASCO project, which we heard about this morning, um, Pathways to a Zero Carbon Oxfordshire. But feeding into that has been quite a lot of my other work, um, especially around the food, agriculture, biodiversity, land use and energy. That's FABLE, the FABLE model, which is a UK and, and international model, um, looking at land use trade-offs. And also my work with the Nature Based Solutions Initiative. And just to say, um, nature-based solutions, by definition, have benefits for both people and biodiversity. So bioenergy production doesn't usually fall within that classification. But the Pathways to a Zero Carbon Oxfordshire work looked at balancing the need for bioenergy with also the need for nature-based solutions, such as planting trees and restoring ecosystems. And then finally, the Healthy Ecosystems Restoration in Oxfordshire, the HERO project, where we're working with local stakeholders to map natural capital and support nature recovery. So it's really about how we can balance the need for bioenergy and solar energy and housing with all these other competing demands. So the approach is a, a kind of simplified version of what we did in the FABLE calculated project. 
um, it, it's, a, it's a simpler version of this, but basically it follows the same approach. So we look at the demand for food um, and biofuels based on population and diet. Uh, and that gives us a demand for uh, livestock production and crop production, taking account of food waste, imports and exports. That will then tell us how much pasture and cropland we need, and that will in turn depend on productivity and livestock stocking density. And then we ask the big question, and take, taking into account urban development, um, afforestation targets, areas which are protected for biodiversity, do we actually have enough land to fit in all these different needs? And if not, then we have to go all the way back down the chain, looking at the feasible areas for all these different demands. So the PASCO project, which we did last year for Oxfordshire County Council, looked at four different scenarios towards a zero carbon Oxfordshire, which I'm just going to go through on the, on the next page. And these scenarios came from the National Grid 2020 future energy scenarios for the whole country. And we've downscaled them to Oxfordshire to give the energy part of the, of the project. And then I've added land use um, aspects in line with the same narratives which we use for the energy scenarios. So the steady progression scenario just continues doing the kind of things we're already doing at the moment. And not surprisingly, that does not achieve net zero. The other three scenarios um, developed by the National Grid all achieve net zero, but in different ways. So societal transformation focuses very much on consumer practices and behaviour, whereas technological transformation focuses on technical solutions. And Oxfordshire leading the way does both, and it, it tries to see how Oxfordshire can go beyond, so above and beyond, to contribute not only to its own net zero target, but also to the wider UK targets. There are some common assumptions for all these scenarios. One is, is the housing growth. We assume 6,000 new dwellings a year to 2030. That's, that's what's needed to continue to deliver the 100,000 new homes growth deal target. And then beyond that, we assumed 4,000 a year to 2050. And we also took into account the government's target to ban sale of petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. So a quick look at bioenergy in the UK. We actually import um, most of our bioenergy resources. We only produced 11% of our own transport biofuel feedstock in 2019 and imports have quadrupled over the last 10 years. 1.6% uh, of our arable land, which is 96,000 hectares, was used for bioenergy crops in 2019, and that was mainly maize for anaerobic digestion. But all four of the national grid scenarios depend on quite large quantities of bioenergy for HGV fuel, um, aviation and shipping fuel, and also biomass heating and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is a negative emissions technology. So these are the four national grid scenarios. Um, under steady progression, bioenergy is used mainly for, um, for power generation, for aviation, and for, for biomethane blending, so it's blending into the natural gas distribution network. Um, societal transformation does more of, more of that for power generation, more for aviation, more for heat. But, um, and then technological transformation does the same, but also adds in a heavy focus on hydrogen production. So there's a big focus on hydrogen for energy, partly from natural gas with, um, with carbon capture and storage, but also partly from bioenergy. And Oxfordshire leading the way has even, even bigger targets because into that we also add production of fuel for, uh, production of fuel for shipping um, as our contribution to the wider UK net zero targets. So we've got some quite ambitious um, targets in terawatt hours down on that bottom row there. So what we did um, to translate this into what it means for Oxfordshire land use is we took some forestry commission guidance on how many gigajoules you can produce from one hectare, which we tried, so we ended up with megawatt hours per hectare. And then we assumed, we made assumptions on uh, which type of bioenergy feedstock would be used for each type of sector. So the power sector, we seem to be split between short rotation coppice and miscanthus grass. And the, heat, the residential heating sector, we assume, will be split between biomass, wood chippings, and biogas, and sugar beet, and so on. So using this technique, we worked out how much land we'd need across Oxfordshire, based on those yields. Um, so it was split out by terawatt hours on the left and by hectares on the right. And down the bottom there, you can see how many hectares of land we think we would need if we were to provide all the bioenergy in those national grid scenarios within Oxfordshire. Now bear in mind Oxfordshire is about 250,000 hectares. So we can see some quite staggering figures down the bottom row there. 
even under the steady progression scenario, we're looking at 37% of what's appears land completely covered in biofuel crops to meet that need, which the national grid envisages as part of its future energy scenarios. And for oxygen leading the way, that goes up to 56% of our land. Now, clearly, this is completely unrealistic. So um, for the PASCO scenarios, you know, we couldn't model that because it would, need it would leave no land at all for food production, um, housing, nature, and so on. So we've actually cut that right back to much smaller targets. And we basically assumed that steady regression would only, um, we wouldn't produce any of that bioenergy in, in Oxfordshire, it would all be imported. And the, the societal transformation, we were saying 20,000 hectares would be used in Oxfordshire and the rest imported. Uh, technological transformation, 25,000 hectares and so on. So, so we're basically assuming quite large imports from outside the county, either from the rest of, U, rest of the UK or else from overseas to satisfy that bioenergy um, in the national grid scenarios. So th these are the assumptions that we've made down the bottom here, 10,000, 20,000 or 25,000 hectares within Oxfordshire and the rest of that would all have to be imported. So I think this really helps to kind of illustrate um, what, you know, what the implications of talking about increasing our bioenergy demand. Current land use in Oxfordshire, it's 70% is used for intensive farmland, um, about two thirds of that is arable crops, and about half of those crops, if you look at the UK as a whole, go for animal feed. So um, the grassland and half of the crops basically all goes to provide livestock products. Um, we, have, we only have about 9% woodland, and of that, two thirds is plantations and about one third is semi natural woodland. And then very, very small quantities of um, other natural habitats. So alongside the zero carbon targets, we also are looking at nature recovery targets to increase those very small areas of um, grassland, woodland, and parkland, and so on for nature. Um, so we can see very, very low areas of non-wooded natural habitats, only 0.6% um, scrub, not point, well, there's only six, six hectares of heat in the whole of Oxfordshire, 3.7% semi-natural grassland and 1% wetland and so on. So a big need to balance the need for bioenergy with the need to restore nature. So just going through the four different scenarios now, so for steady progression, um, so the natural grid scenarios is 2.2 terawatts of bioenergy, gradual deployment of heat pumps, sort of gradual continuation of what's going on at the moment. So that means actually ele electricity demand increases by 74%, gas demand only falls by 6%. And in terms of land use, there's a continued loss of land for housing and infrastructure. So there's 9,000 hectares already allocated for development between 2011 and 2031, which is an additional 3.5% of Oxfordshire. Um, half of our land is still used for livestock farming, as I just showed on, on that previous slide. Solar farms under this scenario would occupy an additional 700 670 hectares of farmland. And under this scenario, our assumption is that there'd be no new land for bioenergy because all those feedstocks would be imported. Under societal transformation, and there's a big focus on consumer behaviour, so a, a huge energy efficiency retrofit programme in our buildings. Um, gas demand falls to zero by 2050, um, and electricity demand doubles, driven by heat pump deployment. Solar energy quintuples, uh, of which a quarter is on rooftops. So that reduces the area used for ground um, solar farms. And then there's a big bioenergy demand um, and also big focus on sustainable transport, walking, cycling, public transport, and so on. So what that means in terms of land use is we're saying we can have more compact developments with fewer cars. So that reduces the land needed for, for parking space and for roads and so on. So we're saying we'd only have half the area taken up for urban development because we're looking at compact developments designed for walking and cycling and so on. Um, we're saying that everyone would adopt a low meat diet, freeing up farmland for solar farms, bioenergy and nature recovery. And we're saying solar farms would occupy an additional 15,000 hectares of farmland. There'd be 10,000 hectares of bioenergy crops. And that would, that would allow us to double our woodland area from 9% to 18%. That's in line with the CCC scenarios for tree planting to so carbon. And we can also double that area of other habitats, grasslands, scrub, heath and wetland, from the current 4.5% to 9%. Um, farmers will be shifting to agroforestry and regenerative farming. So these are all kind of space-saving measures, you know, re reducing our consumption of meat, 
more compact developments, um, having more, more of the solar on rooftops. This is all freeing up the area that we need for planting trees and bioenergy crops and restoring nature. So quite a different approach under technological transformation. There's less focus on energy efficiency and there's big, big focus on the shift to hydrogen for heat and transport. A lot of that hydrogen comes from gas, natural gas um, with carbon capture and storage. Some of it comes from bioenergy, but there's a big increase in electricity demand. Also a big increase in solar energy, but only 10% of that is now on our roofs. So we need more space on the ground for those big solar farms. Um, there's still a focus on private car use. So although we're shifting to electric vehicles, it's still very much car focused. So what that means is we can't shift to more compact development. We still need a lot of area for, for developments because we're not really that bothered about um, walking and cycling under this scenario. We're still focusing on car use. Solar farms occupy 12,000 hectares of farmland. Um, because there's no dietary change, there's intense competition for land for housing, agriculture and solar farms. 20,000 hectares of bioenergy crops. Um, so that means our tree planting targets are not achieved. We can't double our area of trees because there simply isn't enough space in Oxfordshire for that. Now, under the final scenario, Oxfordshire leading the way, we're kind of combining both the social approach and the technical approach. So we've got 95% of housing retrofit for efficiency and heat pumps. We've got a big focus on hydrogen, but that's mostly used for HGVs and storage. Um, gas demand remains high nationally as a source for hydrogen. Electricity demand doubles, and solar energy actually increases by a factor of 10. So there's a, a really huge emphasis on solar energy here because Oxfordshire is trying to um, punch above its weight in terms of providing energy for the rest of the UK. And 30% of that is on, on roofs. So we've got a, a big bioenergy demand here, and but we're also focusing on walking, cycling, and home working. And we're also saying that we would adopt a low meat diet under this scenario. So again, that does free up farmland. Um, but at the same time, we've got a bigger demand for solar farms and bioenergy crops. So we are able to double our woodland area, but we're not able to double our area of other habitats for nature recovery. So they increase only by 50% rather than doubling under the pre under the societal transformation scenario. So even under, under this very ambitious scenario, it's, it's great for carbon reduction. But we do have some trade-offs here with other aims, such as um, biodiversity recovery. So just looking at all these different scenarios alongside each other now, um, just kind of not focusing on the detail of this slide, but look down the bottom there, and we can see that how much carbon is able to be sequestered in land, in ecosystems, under each of these scenarios. So under the steady regression scenario, we've got 2.6 megatons of carbon sequestered from 2020 to 2050. This is quite a small proportion of our emissions, um, but it's not insignificant. Um, but under the societal transformation scenario, with that bigger emphasis on nature recovery and tree planting, um, that goes up to 6.3 megatons. Um, technical transformation, only 3.7 megatons, and also leading the way, 6 megatons. More interestingly, that the bottom two lines, you can see here, here how much our food demand can still be met in Oxfordshire. So under steady progression, um, because of the housing growth and population growth, the percentage we can meet at the moment falls from, I think, about 60% at the moment, down to 40% by 2050. But under societal transformation with a low meat diet, that, that only, um, that could actually remain at about 60% of our food demand met in Oxfordshire. Under technical transformation, that falls to 39%. And the bioenergy demand, um, under our assumptions about how much we produce compared to how much we, report, we import, is still quite low across all those different scenarios. So, so this chart really shows the competition between those different land uses. So under steady progression, we've got a big loss of farmland to urban development and leaving very little space for wood, new woodlands and uh, nature recovery. Under societal transformation, we've got um, compact development, so only half the area needed for urban development. And that allows us to plant a lot more woodland and um, also converting to, to more extensive grazing rather than intensive farmland. Technical transformation and um, Oxfordshire leading the way have those huge um, bioenergy demands, even though we're still not producing all our bioenergy needs. Um, but the Oxfordshire leading the way, again, with the, the low meat diet, freeing up land for woodland there as well. 
So this shows us how much area we would need for food and bioenergy crops outside Oxfordshire under each of these scenarios. Bearing in mind Oxfordshire is about 250,000 hectares. So under the steady progression scenario, we'd need almost as much land again outside Oxfordshire for food production as there is inside Oxfordshire. That's assuming that food could be produced at the same level of productivity. Um, and similar under te technological transformation. So really this just emphasizes that although um, our PASCO study was only looking at scope one and scope two emissions, so it wasn't looking at imported emissions, actually there is a huge implication for what happens outside Oxfordshire and all of these scenarios. So really what this is showing is, is the importance of making space for nature and carbon sequestration. The importance of shifting to a more plant-based diet, um, half of all grain production in the UK is for animal feed. The importance of reducing food waste and in, in, increasing agricultural productivity, but sustainably. Um, using land sharing options such as agroforestry, planting trees on farmland, more compact urban development, and then also reducing the impacts of bioenergy crops. So avoiding planting biofuels on high grade farmland, um, or selling natural grassland and avoiding over extraction of bioenergy from woodlands. Just to show what I mean by this, this is a, a natural woodland with plenty of complex ivy and shrubs and so on, and plenty of habitat for wildlife here. Um, this is a woodland which has had all its shrubland understory extracted, leaving no habitat whatsoever for, for wildlife. So, this is one potential downside of, of shifting to higher levels of um, use of woodland from thinning and forestry operations. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I hope I've slightly overrun. Sorry about that. And happy to answer any questions at the end. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so you're next. What I'm not, we, we're going to have Q&A at the end. Um, so are you tuning in, Alison? So you'll be able to see the next talk and you'll still be online. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Okay, so you're Sammy, why don't you come and give your talk? Thank you. Okay, another pointer. Great. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me here. It's great to be at the uh, Oxford Energy Network and being part of these very, very important and critical conversations with respect to decarbonization, environmental change, as well as uh, energy system use and change. Um, so uh, my name is Sam and I work as a program director at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, but here I'm also a research assistant with the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment and the Institute of New Economic Thinking at the University of Oxford. And uh, my role is looking at climate economy models and how they shift decision making in policy. Uh, so I'm, I'll be talking about that uh, brief in, in a moment, but I should also put, add the caveat that I am not a modeler, uh, but that's something to keep in mind before we, when, when we go on to discuss it. So, and I will keep it short to give enough time for a discussion. Okay, great. All right, so a quick overview of the net zero uh, landscape. Um, and the main argument here is that uh, uh, there are lots of commitments coming in uh, from different actors, state actors, and uh, also private actors about uh, net zero, but these are falling well short. The uh, research shows that uh, these are mostly inadequate and they will add up uh, based on current projections to roughly 2.4 degrees, let alone uh, 1.5. Um, and there are even if that is implemented, um, even if these pledges are implemented, there is a problem with the committed emissions. So we are nowhere near um, uh, the required action for decarbonization. But there is also another aspect which we don't talk about uh, which, uh, on the climate front, which is the actual the transition to a net zero economy. So the transition to a net zero economy is going to be one of the biggest shifts in technology and in industry and in institutions that uh, we have seen to date. So it's going to be very disruptive and it's going to be a process of high uncertainty, lots of complexity and non-marginal change. We are likely to see the uh, shift in power dynamics and uh, redistribution of, of power as well as a change in 
geopolitics. Now, this is very important to bear in mind. And currently, this transition is being dominated by a narrative of short-term pain versus long-term gain. So in other words, we have to uh, uh, suffer in the short term in taking action on climate change in order to have uh, uh, long-term benefits. And this narrative is, based, is mostly based on the results of uh, climate economy models, or what we classify as climate economy models, and it is the way it's been shaped. So what's the problem here? If, if these models are proposing that, um, you know, the, uh, the transition to net zero is going to involve short-term pain and for long-term gain, what, what, what is the issue that we have with these models? So let's talk about this. So let's hear from the experts. Um, and we should bear in mind that uh, when we talk about climate economy models, we're talking mostly about uh, the computa computational general equilibrium models and integrated assessment models, which uh, are typically the most common used uh, uh, models in uh, climate science and uh, decision making within governments. So let's hear from the experts. So what's the, what's the problem with these models? Uh, Robert Pindike, one of the uh, most important economists of our time, says integrated assessment models have flaws that make them close to useless as tools for policy analysis. And one of the other leading economists, climate economists of our time, Nick Stern, Nick Stern, says that the world deserves better and more robust economic models of climate change. So this is the view among some of the leading academics about the, the problems with climate economy models. So why are these models problematic? We talked briefly about um, the uh, CG models and integrated assessment models, but some of this also applies to uh, economy-wide energy system models. And these are the ones that are most commonly used in, in policy circles. And there is a long list of critiques by uh, leading uh, economists as well as um, other social scientists and even physicists about the way these models uh, uh, essentially plan and uh, offer insights on the transition to net zero. And these long list of critiques uh, are, you know, we, we could go through many of them. There, there, there are many, but some of the most important ones are the assumptions of equilibrium within many, many of these models. It is the fact that they don't account for non-marginal non change. It's that they don't take into account tipping points and they don't deal well with uh, uncertainty, uh, technological shifts, distributional impacts, etc. So there are many, many um, bits and pieces that, that we need to deal with. But, but really, um, if we want to summarize it, we, we would say that there are two big issues with them. One is that they underestimate the impacts of climate change and the costs, but they also underestimate the uh, uh, the transition the benefits of a transition to net zero so that really creates a dynamic that um, in action at least is uh, it, it could lead to a dynamic where in action seems like the optimal policy and the second part of it is that because they're blunt instruments and they're they're they they are quite uncertain they don't offer very uh, nuanced perspectives on the specific policy application and the specific policies that are needed to transition. So for policymakers, they're not very useful in making those types of decisions because of the uncertainty, which leads to a lot of uh, policymakers relying on rules of thumb and going based uh, and kind of following the trend on what has already been happening. So one of the most important parts of um, the discussion around the limitations of climate economy models are damage functions. So damage functions are essentially an estimation of the economic impacts of climate, uh, climate change. Um, and it, they're really a key variable in cost benefit analysis within, within, within policy. And they're a key variable within these uh, models. A lot of the damage functions currently out there are, or what some call the social cost of carbon, are mainly based on essentially extrapolations of the observed relationship between temperature and productivity. So in essence, you know, what does the marginal change in temperature, how does that affect the economy and how does it affect um, um, uh, the uh, different sectors within the economy? 
uh, and uh, what are the damages that we could measure from there. But they don't take into account a lot of other factors. And so really, this is the kind of the, the dominant, and a lot of them have been called as inadequate for uh, measuring the, the the right damages. So the main issues with damage functions is that they are they, they are they fail to at least the ones that have uh, been put forward by economists are that it, they fail to incorporate the latest physical science and many of the uncertainties within. Um, the other one is that they fail to capture tipping points and nonlinear dynamics, uh, which would basically uh, increase the cost dramatically of, uh, cli cli uh, of uh, climate change. They also fail to include um, and account for factors such as uh, you know, da damages to health, biodiversity, and damages caused from land use. So naturally, that keeps the damage function lower than what it would actually be in reality, which what the climate scientists and physicists are telling us will be uh, will, will be the likely damages that we're going to suffer. And finally, it takes to uh, take into account um, uh, events such as natural disasters and extreme weather events, which uh, increase the uh, costs of climate change quite sharply. And so, since this um, figure is an important input into a lot of integrated assessment models and climate economy models, that naturally underestimates the, uh, the damages uh, on, uh, from, from climate change. And in fact, this, uh, this was one of the big critiques of what they call the North House Dice model, which says that optimal climate warming in terms of the uh, economy um, or economic productivity is 3.5 degrees Celsius. And we know from the physics that that is just unthinkable and a 3.5 degree world is an extremely dangerous one and uh, not a fun one to live in. So, and the damages from that are, are, are significant. Now, why does this matter? And that is the key point here, which is about decision-making. So models are important tools for decision making. They're not the sole input into decision making, but they are quite important in framing the decisions that are made in governments, within treasuries, within central banks, etc. Um, they're used for forecasting, uh, essentially prediction of uh, uh, fu the future, but also for uh, evaluating various scenarios. They're used by the International Energy Agency, by uh, as mentioned by um, governments, by the World Bank and the IMF. And they really have an influence on also the expectations of act actors and can create self-fulfilling uh, beliefs such as the short-term uh, pain for long-term gain. But actually, the reality is that it's, it, it, it's quite different. Now, in terms of the influence that these models have at the international level, as I mentioned, the um, IPCC and IAEA, but they also have actually had some uh, impact on, do on domestic level uh, policies. So we're seeing uh, lots of climate laws coming into effect around the world. So there is essentially a, an influence that these models are having on, on, on the transition. Uh, but there is a there is a challenge with the way they're also applied, which is that a lot of uh, these models are not necessarily very transparent. Uh, there is a lot of misuse and there is what you call uh, model capture, which is that the decision is made first and then the model is used and tweaked to support that decision. And uh, there are a lot of political and uh, uh, social issues associated with with being able to actually uh, put this into practice. Um, there's a lot of assumptions and uh, some of the other issues that I essentially mentioned before. So these essentially make uh, the process of uh, 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 modeling the transition to net zero quite difficult. And uh, as mentioned, the, the, the major problems are the underestimation of the damages and uh, the uh, benefits, which can essentially create dynamics for inaction and secondly they, it doesn't actually offer they don't a lot of them don't offer granular policy uh, they, they don't offer answers to granular policy questions uh, so models shape decisions they're not currently fit for the structural transformation that net, net zero tran uh, transition involves as mentioned the, the two issues they, they underestimate, and there is also the uh, they're not effective for a grand or policy questions. But the key point here is that if we are um, to make better decisions around the transition, and to also increase the uh, the 
urgency of action, there is definitely a need for better models of climate change. And in fact, um, Oxford is one of the leading institutions in, uh, in terms of this, uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, the Economic Complexity Group, the Oxford Martin School and the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment have really been leading these efforts in building new models and experimenting with more appropriate um, frameworks and analytical tools for the transition. So as uh, this is from, from, a, from a report that was, or rather a paper that was put together, new analytical frameworks that incorporate methods from dynamical systems, network analysis, and agent-based modeling at a granular level can help to capture essential nonlinear feedback mechanisms. Such models could provide richer and more accurate insights into the costs and benefits of the interventions with amplified effects. More realistic models may increase trust and uh, interest in the results and lead to better informed policy. So with that, I would like to uh, wrap up and open for questions. Thank you very much. Now, is Alison still there? Yep, I'm still here. Yep, yep she's still, good. So I think we have time for questions. I open it to the floor. Anyone have a question? Come on. I'll start picking people out. I mean, that's what I. <laughs> think. Um, I would have a question on the new models. So, what do you think are the most important features to incorporate? Because, for example, extreme weather events are rare normally, but they have dramatic effects. Mm -hmm. So they might actually have a huge impact, whereas uncertainty is a thing that you generally need a lot. Um, and how does this, um, in general, uncertainty discussions, how do they influence how models are um, used for policymaking or um, in public perception? Because, yeah, uncertainty is something that I think the general public is in general very it's hard to handle if you don't really know what it is. Yep, yeah, and uh, that's part of the problem. For, for instance, uh, uh, as mentioned, a lot of the models don't actually look at, uh, you know, low probability by very uh, high effect events, such as natural disasters. Uh, so they just don't model that. So the assumption is that they don't happen and the economy will just continue and it will move back into equilibrium. And so, it, it just doesn't capture that. And, and that's, a, that's a huge problem because it changes the costs and benefits of, of action. But also in terms of the un, un, uncertainty more broadly, they don't deal well with uncertainties in general. Um, uh, and this is a big critique um, that, that they have. And also you said, you know, what type of models tend to, uh, what, what are the key features? There, there are many. Um, actually, there's a massive list that we had to write on um, and we had to from there we had to pick top 10 because there were so many different um, limitations um, but some of the most you know important ones being that it, they don't capture these nonlinear dynamics they assume um, a movement back into the equilibrium uh, but also they don't account for technological shifts so they completely uh, uh, missed uh, and they, they they failed at predicting the, the very quick fall in renewable prices yeah. globally. So that, that, was a, that was based on a lot of the assumptions that the IEA made based on uh, the cost of renewables was, was using these types of models. And they continuously, and they still do to this day, uh, are uh, not predicting it accurately. Yeah. If I may ask a following question on that. So it's actually true. Uh, one of them is, are there models out there yet which are able to incorporate it better? And the second question is, um, are those, um, do they also incorporate vulnerability and exposure in their models? I mean, this is, for example, an extreme weather event is a very driving feature. It doesn't really matter if we have a drought somewhere where no one lives and no one has agriculture, but if it's, are there better models out there? Yes, there. Uh, over the past couple of decades, we're seeing uh, improvement in models with uh, you know endogenous technological uh, variables, uh, but they're they're still not great. 
Um, and there are a lot, there's a lot of room for improvement, um, starting with the damage function, which is kind of the low hanging fruit, but there is a lot of structural um, changes that need to be made to the models as well. Uh, but typically agent-based models uh, are seen um, as a, a viable alternative for uh, really assessing very complex dynamics that the net zero transition has. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's because um, in, in typical economic models, you just have one agent, so just a, a household, and they all essentially have the same behavior. With um, agent-based models, you can have multiple different agents with different behaviors, and you can create a much more complex and a, a system that uh, more accurately reflects reality. In terms of exposure, no, it doesn't capture very well. Though at least the mainstream models don't very don't capture the uh, the vulnerability aspects and distribution, which is the the impact on different uh, um, income groups. Uh, so that's another major gap, um, particularly for developing countries who have large parts of their population quite exposed. Uh, so there, there is definitely um, some some gaps there that need to be addressed as well. Okay. Actually, I, I'm going to ask a question. Of Al- have you got a question no, for no. Alison? Or... No, no, you go. Okay. Uh, Alison, I'm going to ask about your four scenarios because um, they paint obviously different pictures. Uh, over what time scale can they be implemented? Uh, and I guess, how do you affect that imp- implementation? So the models run from 2020 to 2050. Um, that we also modeled an intermediate point at 2030 because that's important for many of the um, Oxford County Council net zero targets and so on. Um, so as I say, they were derived, the energy part of those scenarios was derived from the national grid scenarios so that we didn't create those ourselves. We just filled in what it meant for Oxfordshire. Whereas the land use narrative was filled in um, by myself because that wasn't included in the in the framing by the National Grid group. I mean, there's nothing in those scenarios that can't be achieved by 2050, and a lot of it could be achieved much faster. I mean, the behaviour change aspects, such as shifting to a a lower meat diet to free up land for other carbon reduction activities, could happen overnight, in theory. Um, It's just a case of people deciding to change their behaviour. Obviously, tree planting, if you plant a tree, it takes a while to, to grow. It takes about 10 years before it really starts absorbing a lot of carbon. Um, but it's not just about planting trees, it's all about, also about restoring grasslands, wetlands, heathlands, which also store a lot of carbon in their soil. Um, regenerative farming to increase carbon stored in soil, again, does take time. Um, but, you know, as, as Sam was saying, all these things have many additional benefits, you know, for nature, for climate resilience, um, for health and well-being. So there's really, yeah, a huge, huge window of opportunity, and there's nothing there that can't be done um, in the framework of meeting our carbon targets by 2050 and, and, and then onwards to 20, like 20, 2030 and 2050. I, I guess what I'm wondering is, is how do you effect the change, say, in Oxfordshire? Um, does it have to be through the planning process or uh, you know, how do you make farmers change their, their model of farming? Yes, so in terms of the model of farming, um, that's got a lot to do with ELMS, the new Agri-Environment Support Scheme post-Brexit, which is it's kind of not yet finalised. It's, it's kind of emerging in bits and pieces from DEFRA, and there's a lot more that could be done there. For example, agroforestry currently has no support at all within ELMS, astonishingly. Um, initially, it looked like it was going to be quite good and quite ambitious, but it's beginning to be watered down, um, as always happens with these things. So I think there's a lot more that DEFRA could do to support sustainable farming activities. Um, a lot of the behaviour change is really about education and awareness, which sounds easy, but it's actually very hard to achieve in practice, exactly the same as with energy demand reduction types of behaviour change. Uh, and then the planning issues, um, as we heard this morning, there's not very much we can do about the actual housing targets at the moment, um, unless there's a change within central government. But there's a lot that can be done in terms of how we build those houses and much stronger planning guidance in terms of compact developments, um, getting more green roofs on houses and so on, that can be done via local plans and much stronger um, sort of planning guidance. Okay, yep, down. <laughs> Sam, more of a practical question. Yeah. Um, once these models, I mean, it looks like there are some um, models that are already in a place that are 
should be integrated. Um, what kind of actors need to be integrating these and be using them? And how difficult is it for them to switch their models? It's a very good question. So there are two types of actors, I think, that are critical. One are intergovernmental organizations or international organizations, such as the IPCC, the, Intergov uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the International Energy Agency, uh, the World Bank and the IMF, uh, because a lot of um, policymakers around the world do look at the data that they produce and the models that they produce and the results that they have, and they use that to really inform their policies, uh, especially in many parts of the developing world. The other set of actors are the central banks, the treasuries, the planning ministries, um, and actually, I, I would say we we don't have enough information about how those models are applied. But it is critical because they are really the ones who essentially make the decisions on how they want to transition their economies. So those are the two actors that we need to essentially uh, get to change the way they uh, currently model um, climate change. Uh, is it easy? Uh, absolutely not, because essentially they, you know, a lot of the modeling teams within both international organizations and as well as uh, national governments, uh, they have been doing this for a long time and turning around and saying, well, you know, your models aren't good enough. I don't think is a very constructive way of going about it uh, because they're attached to those models. They're, they, know how, they know how to use them. So it's much easier for them to, to, to stick to the tools that they have uh, essentially been using for quite some time. Uh, so yeah, it is the, the, the process of getting um, these government agencies to change, and as well as international organizations to change their the tools which they operate with. I think is very important. But uh, the I think this is not a process of um, you know just barging down and saying do this. It is working with them and showing that perhaps there are better ways of doing this. Uh, also, be, um, having the humility to also learn from them. Um, and how they use their models and where they think, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a better uh, application of modules uh, would be. So I think it's a process of collaboration. Uh, it's difficult, but I think that's something that um, uh, Oxford Smith School and INET and others are uh, trying to do. But I think it's a very important question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think short question, because we're at the end of the time. Yeah. We need to move back to the other. Okay, it's just a rather technical one uh, oh, yeah. because you mentioned. Uh, Maybe better to do that afterwards at drinks. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. I just wanted to ask: Are you employing any kind of discounting, or how do you value the role of discounting in economical models? It is critical. It's a major finding in the Stern review, and it can change um, the the results quite dramatically. So yes, discounting is is critical. Uh, and they're, they're applied at different stages of this. So in cost benefit analysis and some of the, these tools that are used, discounting is a major factor. Um, and again, that is another example of uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is that modeling alone, changing just the tools alone is not going to be sufficient. You actually need to also change the decision-making processes as well with it. And that takes time to set up. Uh, but that is one example because different um, uh, it, it, it's, it, there is no set rule for, for discounting. So that can also change the results quite dramatically, but that's something that needs to be uh, looked at if we're actually serious about um, changing the climate dynamics and the right policies. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And let's thank the speakers in the traditional way. <laughs> So I think we're back into the lecture theatre one. There's some discussion, I guess. Make sure that you contribute to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I can say that. Yeah, I can say Assumptions people are 
Climate change means that they are literally having like a breakdown, the mental, like, like it's, 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 and everyone has, has a problem. Um, and I mean, yeah, but nonetheless, we have to do it. Okay, so I'm <laughs> okay, now you look like you're having fun. Okay. And I look a bit concerned because the world is burning. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay, because this is not a video. Okay, fine. I think that's funny. <laughs> yeah, you want more of them? Do you want more of them? Oh no, I have an old you on now. I think I cannot believe that they're making it for Seeing themselves. Just where we were before. No, 